All right. Uh, my name is Vishal. I'll be your facilitator for next roughly 90 minutes. The topic is driving engagement with user stories. Uh, anyone who's not worked with user stories, if you can raise your hands. You all have? Good. So some basic basics about user stories is good. Uh, the best way to get in touch with me is through LinkedIn. And this QR code usually will take you to LinkedIn. But because it's a projector screen, I do not know if it will scan or not. It will scan on my laptop if you want. There will be one QR code towards the end as well. Or you can just search for Vishal Prasad IN and you will get in touch with me. All right. Uh, just a quick agenda of the things that we are going to do. And uh, it is going to be a slightly fast paced session because there's loads of things to do. Just to give you a, an idea, this is actually a one day workshop that's condensed into 90 minutes. So uh, there might be certain times when you will be running out of time, don't worry about it. Uh, that's when you take care of the time box. So I'll keep on telling you when your time box expires. The only request is the law of the facilitator, so please listen to me. Otherwise you may miss out on certain things and I don't want that. And also if time runs out and you still have some things that you want to discuss, then there is a parking lot that I've created right over there. You can just put your points and put it on the parking lot towards the end of the session. We'll take the parking lot. Also a good thing, there is a coffee break after this. So two things might happen. Either you will have time to speak with me or if you're sleepy, you'll get coffee. Okay, so both are good outputs. Uh, let's work towards that. Uh, the entire session is uh, divided into four parts and I have something that you also need to pay attention to. If you see over here at the bottom, I don't have slide numbers. That's actually the time, the time when we are supposed to end this particular slide. And this is going to be on every slide so that we are on time and we finish by 2.55. So we'll still have five minutes for any questions or any wrapping up parking lot stuff to do. Okay, so in case I'm overshooting, keep me accountable and tell me whenever it's happening. All right, it's going to be an interactive session, okay? So be ready for it. So four parts, uh, we'll do, each of the parts are roughly 20 minutes. We'll do part one, we'll do some unlearning so that we can start learning the new concepts. Then we'll get into some refinement of whatever we have learned. In the third part is when it might get a little advanced for a lot of folks. Uh, if you have not done it before, so we'll get into specification by examples. And then towards the end, we'll end with some general guidelines that you need to keep in mind. It's not to say that you have not been working right with user stories, of course you have been. These are concepts where I personally feel that it's a very powerful tool and we underutilize it quite a lot. So the entire session is around how you can use this tool to interact with any stakeholder that you want. It can be anyone from the CEO till your team members and you can utilize these tools to engage them and then see how you can build products around it. Okay? Sounds good? Be on time? You go ahead. Okay. Everyone has post-its on their tables, sketch pins, post-its, at least a few. Okay. Uh, you might want to join some other table because we need at least three people on each table or you might get someone from another table so that you have three. All right. So let's move on to part one. Anyone who wants to speak up something like expectation setting before we dive in? Any requests? Anything you want me to keep in mind? Okay. So let's start with the very first thing. What is user stories? Yeah. It's gonna be a time boxed activity. So I'll give you two minutes to discuss on your table first. According to you, what do you feel are user stories? And then we'll discuss over here. All right, so two minutes only for you. Go ahead and discuss what according to you are user stories on your tables. Get to know each other, ask your names first.
No, as long as you discuss, it's fine. I'll ask you anyway. You need to be on the same page before you talk to me. All right, pens down. I'm assuming all of you on the table are in sync. Like you agree on the table what user stories are. Fair? Let's hear it out loud. What are user stories? Anyone? Yes. So there is a template to write, it's the smallest unit of work, it has a Y. Yeah. So it has got an MVP part of to it, it's a standard MVP part of incremental order. It's a smallish increment. And it has to be vertically sliced. Uh, has to be vertically sliced. Yeah. So that it covers all the layers of the system. So, uh, and, and it's not Good. component based. Yeah. All right. Okay. It's not component based, you said. Yeah. From a component feature perspective. Can be, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. So we have different way of looking at it. So Go ahead. It's, it's it's just a conversational requirement. It's From a conversational conversational requirement, conversational requirement mm -hmm. that adds value mm -hmm. to the end user, and it could be at any level. Mm -hmm. Okay, you could say this user story is at a high, very fifty thousand feet overview level, yeah. which could just be like you know, say okay, I want to have a claims processing. Yeah, why I want to have claims? All that can be just as a conversation. It's not something that. Uh, business user can understand at the same mm -hmm. time that same language a developer can also understand what is being needed they can go so, ahead and make more formal out of it but initially user story is just a conversational requirement which adds value fair so it's a conversation starter yes can be at multiple levels can be at the highest level till the deepest level uh, one more thing you said that other information can be added to can it. be added as, as, move, as we move forward fair Let's take one more and then we proceed. It's a single piece of functionality. A single piece of functionality. It's a piece of functionality which brings value to the customer. All right. A vertical slice. So a vertical slice that brings value to your customer, one single piece of functionality. None of those are bad descriptions, okay? So at some level, all of these are acceptable. How many of you use a project management tool? Use? Uh, let's not name, <coughs> perfectly fine. But there are some that we use. Uh, do you see any harm in using any of these tools? What? They try to mold your mindset with the wordings that they are using in their tool. So, Fair. like his, uh, sorry, <coughs> our table's description is it's a conversational starter, etc. Mm. Et which is fair, right? But because I use a certain tool, in my tool it is said that it is the last level of granularity hmm. from the requirement stage. So I think it creates a perception in the person using the tool that this is what it is supposed to be. Fair. So kind of molds you into some kind of a template and maybe at some point of time you start using their vocabulary. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure there are a number of folks who call out Jira stories. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea what that is. Because Jira is one of the most widely used tools, we end up saying Jira stories. It's fine. There are typically two things which I dislike, but we'll come to that a little later. Here's my definition of a user story. I'm saying in a written form, 
it describes a functionality that's valuable either to a user or a customer. Having said that, this is what I'm saying in a written form. What you said, sir, is that it is a conversational starter. How do you differentiate the two, like the written form and the conversational starter? If you have to. Conversation can have several divergence to it, sir, depending mm -hmm. upon the flow of communication. Then when we link to a written form, we are converging on understanding and getting the function. Yes. So the way I look at it is, it's a placeholder for a conversation to happen. So it's a placeholder that you write something on a piece of paper, then the conversation happens. After the conversation, you usually tear off the paper. Tear it off, burn it, put it in the dustbin. You do it, right? Yes? No? No. Why not? Because you usually have a tool and the tool has a historic view of everything that you have been doing. So yeah, you don't do that. Mm. Okay, we'll see what to do about it. But for now, I'm saying that a conversational starter or a placeholder is probably something that after the conversation you can discard. So even if it's a story, you can discard the story. So whatever happens, like production you said, whenever the time comes, tear it off, throw it in the dustbin. It's not needed anymore. We don't usually do that. I'm not understanding what exactly this conversation started. <coughs> okay. Let's take a simple example. How did you find the food? Good. Describe it a bit. Okay. Which things did you like? Like non veg plus fine. Okay. And tapas were good. Okay. All other textures. What desserts? We had more desserts today. We had yeah. desserts. Oh, we, we had, had more desserts. desserts. <laughs> Last day. Nice. We did a bad job of gulab jamun. We had a bad job of gulab jamun. Massacred gulab jamun. What, what massacred gulab jamun. It's not recorded. <laughs> I want to be invited next time. <laughs> cool, so that's, that's a good conversation. So somewhere on a sticky I may have written, let's talk about lunch. We have spoken about this. I can tear off that sticky and throw it away and move on to the next discussion. It's a conversation start. It's a place for it. There is going to be an end and something new is going to start. But if you tear it off, you will lose the context to the people. You don't just... You will have to keep the context in a different way. And we'll come to that also. We'll address that as well. In the third section, we'll discuss that. How is the food when you're trying to have an action and then follow up the process? When you're going to crack the story in the story? So you're going to make sure that... Good example for parking lot. Let's put it. And we'll discuss that. But yeah, fair point. Okay, so we have historic view. We don't usually tear off our tickets and we don't throw it in the dustbin. Uh, by the end of this talk, or this workshop, I hope that you will start doing that. Even though you have Jira and I don't know how much that will work out, or Sprints, so. Uh, but let's say that is the intent of this entire workshop, to see if we can slowly move towards that. So let's do the first activity. You're gonna get three minutes, three minutes per table, or group of three, however you want to do it. Uh, someone said that there are templates, the story has a template, you need to put certain values in those templates. That's pretty much the exercise. Uh, you have post-its with you. You're going to identify as many components in the template as you can when you are writing a user story with your team. Right? Even if all the tables have some duplicates, that's fine. That just reinforces our belief in it. And whatever you can think of, everything from the narrative till acceptance, in scope, out scope, UI, whatever you can think of, for your team to develop your software, the components that you add in a user story. Simple exercise? All good? Let's start. Three minutes. Start with the person, as a developer, as a end user, something, something, at least. 
Acceptance criteria. DOD. Definition of ready, definition of done, and the acceptance criteria. Okay. Estimates. Artifacts. Assumptions. Release. 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 Priority. Why? Why? Okay. Just shout out. So, how many conversation starter for us? We yeah. don't get into definition of done and all at that stage. Perfectly fine. Just mention the components. Yeah, so it's just who, <coughs> what and why we are doing it, the user story. And it becomes a conversation starter. Okay. And then from that we derive the acceptance criteria and all. And we have some exclusions. That's it. Exclusion. Yeah. Extensions, exclusions. Exclusions like what we are not doing in this Exception. Story. So uh, Exception. the most important are estimation. Estimation. Okay. Moments that matter in their journey. What matters? Moments that matter. Moments that matter. Okay. And the parent feature also. The parent feature. All right. Middle table. Anything? Card conversation confirmation. Okay. Dependencies. Dependencies. Okay. I'll, I'll help you out. In scope. Out scope. Rates. Moscow. Okay. Moscow. <laughs> what more? <laughs> It's okay, tell me the components. Don't worry about being right or wrong at this time. Just say the components. Come on. Fixed version. That's a zero thing. Fixed version. Is it original story or sprint story? Is the original story or sprint story? Okay. All of you, now pay attention to me. Okay? If you give me so many components in the template, I'm not going to do it. No, tell me what is the difference between any other requirements, document, functional specification, use cases, technical specification, whatever you must have heard of, and user stories. What's the difference? It's more organized. Hey, nothing is better, difference. more organized than a long 50 page document. It's a simple so, if you start looking at that, there's no difference. That's why there's no difference. 
But that's a problem, right? Then why create one more thing to do? No, it's a very simplest to form of a, a functional data. Yeah, but but you just are, you just said everything. Tell me a difference between use cases and what you have written. In use cases, we have alternative flows. We have got preconditions. Someone said alternate flows. But in user right. stories, we don't. Who said alternate flows? Who said alternate flows? <laughs> <laughs> That's a part of the use case. <laughs> Someone said alternate flows, he's saying alternate flows are not there. I'm saying that's fine, you have it in your stories, that's all. <laughs> okay, so. The lies in the splitting or chunking part, it just makes the scope of that reduced instead of having a 50 page document. Probably the difference lies that we don't know the difference. <laughs> we have been taught or we have accepted a way of working in our organizations in such a way and we haven't questioned it for a very long time and that's why there is a difference there's definitely a difference we just don't know what the difference is and even if we know the difference because we may have written we may have read some book we don't implement it when we go back to practice so let's call it out ram said right there are three things that we want to focus on when it comes to user stories there is a card, a card that you can tear off after the conversation is over. The card is the thing that keeps it small. That's another thing that I do not like about tools, because the description field of the tools can help you write a book. So a card, that means it's small. It's forcing you to be small. It's a conversation starter. So once you have written something on a card, you go to someone. That someone can be anyone. Anyone from the CEO till the CTO to your team members. You have a conversation around it and if there is an action associated with it as I think Ram you mentioned if there's an action associated with it we need to confirm on what that final outcome is going to be so there are three things that we need to consider the card conversation and the confirmation confirmation basically are nothing but tests something that most of the team members do not write or do not identify while we are working with user stories. We may do it during development, but not beforehand. And we will see how we can get there. That's the confirmation part of it. So in short, the user stories do not have a structure. As long as these three things are fulfilled. Uh, you all may be using a template called as a I want so that. No? Good. There's nothing bad in using that template. Having said that, it's just one way of writing stories. A story can be as simple as three words, that's all. You can also simply write one word as long as the entire team understands. There's a concept called metaphor. As, all, as long as the entire team understands what it is, that's a conversation starter, that's your story. It's one sticky on the wall. So the first thing that we need to unlearn is start putting all the information that you have defined as a part of a template. A template is there to help you, not for you to add in mandatory items. Now, I do not, uh, I won't say that it's your fault because there are a lot of organizations that would create these templates in tools and there will be certain sections of the tool which will be marked as mandatory. Just put in any value that you want and move on. Okay, don't spend your time on worrying about it as long as you have these three. Fair? So we good on time so far? Oh, a little bad. We'll see. <clears throat> so let's do this. Okay. We're going to write a story. Now that you know that there are only three things that you have to consider when you're going to write a story. Think of the card. Think of the conversation you want to have. And I need some confirmation as to how you're going to test this functionality is done or not. Card con conversation confirmation, that's it, okay? Uh, three minutes in group of three. So if you have four is also fine, but if you have a good group of three, that will be nice because we'll utilize this again in the next exercises. Uh, the three pointers are here to guide you. If you want to just pay attention to the screen ones, the three points over there are to guide you. So begin with a goal. What is it that the user wants? I kind of have mentioned it, that you want to view your emails. That's a good goal to have. Uh, have a conversation as to 
how are you going to view that? Like, what's going to happen? What is this entire functionality that I have to build? And then come up with some tests. If three minutes, you won't get everything, that's fine. Whatever you can do in three minutes. Fine? Go for it. You're writing it in group of threes, group of threes. Okay, four is fine. Okay, pay attention now. I have a change request. Folks, pay attention. I have a change request. You can <laughs> So depressed. What? Wait. Not more than two stickies. Your entire story. Not more than two stickies. I'm giving you a leeway. Not more than two stickies. Okay? Not more than two stickies. Okay, pens down. Hold your conversations. Please confirm you're listening to me. Hey, come on, law, law of the facilitator. Look here, folks, don't fight. Just a workshop. May I? Okay. Keep those stories safe because we are going to use it for the uh, for one of the next exercises. So keep it safe. Ensure that it, it's not uh, getting lost in conversation. Translate. <clears throat> Let's move on to part two. Okay. So what have you learned in part one? Quick recap. Three C's. And have all the templates also in place, right? The template should be kept properly. Who said yes? <laughs> That's the whole point. Get rid of your templates. Remember three things. It has to be as small as it can be written on a card. In fact, if you are starting your, uh, if you're starting with story, and if you have a tool, it's better to first start writing things on a card and then putting it in the tool. Over time, you will build that necessary muscle memory to start doing it directly in the tool. But just to build that muscle memory, first 
start writing things on the card and then moving it to the tool. Right? So three C's, as long as you remember that, we can go to the next section. <coughs> so why stories? Fine, we said it's one more way of uh, getting your requirements in place, right? If you have use cases, you have specifications, functional documents. Why stories? What's so great about stories? Storytelling is the right way. Okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's good to say that writing is pretty much the last thing that you do. There's a lot of things that happen in between, but you still have like what, four questions over here that I've written, right? Why even change? If you're not using stories, why even move to stories? Why write it on cards? Why hold conversation? Why not continue writing requirements document? Okay, so it absorbs change better. It's incremental delivery. No one reads 200 pages, okay. We are good at understanding stories, the absorption is better. Okay, we'll do one conversation at a time. <laughs> it's slightly better. Fair. Time to clarify. It's a flow. One second. Sorry. It, it brings in more engagement, okay. There's only that much that you can convey by writing. Writing, okay. More of talking. <coughs> it clarifies certain things, okay. Just like why you have different chapters in a book. I don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. So let me ask you a question at this time, because I have interviewed like many, many people, and this is, I usually ask them, what's your process about working with requirements? Uh, many a times I have heard that they say that, hey, there are some BRDs which are written. They go for a sign off with the customer. The customer signs it off. Then the documents come to us. Then we split it into stories and give it to development. Have you heard this before? Yeah. Have you done it? Yeah. I'll give you a better one. Hmm. If you are going to adopt something, you need to stop something else. Otherwise, you are adding more to your process. It's not going to help. So if you want to make your process lightweight by utilizing a lightweight method, then you have to get rid of those which are not lightweight. So if you say that you are going to adopt user stories, it needs to be user stories across. Now that brings other questions as to how do you get sign-offs and everything. Unfortunately, this is not the workshop for that. But there are ways of doing that. But let's say that's one of the reasons. Like if you're taking a lightweight method, you need to take your lightweight method throughout. Okay? So fine. We have stories. It's one way of doing it. Having said that, can we be agile with use cases? Use case documents? You can be? Okay? Yeah, so if there's any hesitation to say that you cannot be agile with use cases, the, the notion of stories are a promise for conversation came from Alistair Coburn, who's a signatory of Agile Manifesto. And he's also the one who's written the book, Working with Effective Use Cases in Agile Teams. Patterns on use cases. Patterns on use cases. Okay, so he's known for it. So no one is saying that if you are an agile team, you have to move to stories. That's not the intent. But if you're going to work with stories, then you need to embrace the entire aspect of it so that it is more effective, right? So I do have a video for you over here. We'll see that video and then we'll have a short discussion. You may have seen this before. You're not making any sense. 
Zarya no. ruined it on purpose. He knows how to make one. What's up, the internet? You know what? I'm hungry. I could really go for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Okay. Do you guys think you can write down some instructions and teach me how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Yeah. Then do it. I knew we were gonna do this. I heard dad talking to mom. <laughs> Choke yourself on my hand. Sometimes they do what you tell them. <laughs> <laughs> Step one, get two pieces of bread out. Got them. Get a butter knife and get some PB. Take one piece of bread, spread it around with the butter knife. No, Dad, with the peanut butter. I'm just doing what it says. It says, take one piece of bread, spread it around with the, bu with the butter knife. Hold on. Get some jelly, rub it on the other half of the bread. Dad, open the jelly. Well, it doesn't say to do that. Put the breads together on top of each other. Take a big bite. <laughs> this doesn't taste like a peanut butter jelly sandwich. <laughs> Failed. Mmm, yeah, oh yeah. Mmm. Sorry, I had to. I had to make it extremely specific. Oh good, I'm starving. Take two pieces of white bread out of the bag. Take the lid off the jar of peanut butter. Get a butter knife and stick it inside of the peanut butter jar. With the knife, scoop a bit of peanut butter out of the- A bit, that means like a lot. A bit means a lot? In my world. Spread your scoop of peanut butter onto one of your pieces of bread with the knife. All right, there we go. You're doing better than before though. Open the jelly jar. Uh -huh. Squeeze it onto the other piece of bread. No. Done. Closer. Get two pieces of bread. Get some peanut butter. Take the peanut butter knife. Open the peanut butter. Put the knife in the PB. Get some jelly. Open the jelly. No. Squirt the jelly oh. onto the bread. You're Take the butter knife with the peanut butter on it. <laughs> Wipe it all over the piece of bread that's blank. Take the butter knife, rub the jelly all over the piece of bread. Oh, he's doing better. Oh. Oh. It says all over. <laughs> Put the two pieces on top of each other. This is how I meant. <laughs> Take two pieces of white bread out of the bag. Take the lid off the jar of peanut butter. Get a butter knife and stick it inside of the peanut butter jar. With the knife, scoop some of the peanut butter out of the inside of the jar. Spread That's your scoop of peanut butter onto one of your pieces of bread with the knife. No! Squeeze some jelly onto the other piece of bread. Spread the jelly on the bread with the butter knife. Put your two pieces of bread, peanut butter and jelly sides together. <laughs> Done. Get two pieces of bread. Get some peanut butter. Get some jelly. Open the peanut butter. Get a butter knife. Put the butter knife in the peanut butter. Take the butter knife out of the peanut butter. <laughs> you did it wrong. No. <laughs> take one piece of bread and take the butter knife that has the peanut butter on it and spread it all over the top of the piece of bread. Dad, the... That's the top. I mean the sides. Squirt some on another piece of bread. Take the butter knife, rub it all over the top of the piece of bread. I quit. You're not even making any sense. Sorry, you ruined it on purpose. He knows how to make one. <laughs> I know, Evan, it's the joke. It's the, it's the game that we're playing. <laughs> oh. <laughs>
Do you know how to eat a piece of bread? <laughs> you want to take your sandwich with you? Oh, this is so good. This looks like a yummy sandwich. <laughs> Glad I made that for you. <laughs> Can I have the same one with it? Yeah, go take that one to mommy. Okay. I edited a bit. Take two pieces of white bread, take the lid off the jar of peanut butter, get a butter knife and stick it inside of the peanut butter jar. With the knife, scoop some of the peanut butter out of the inside of the jar. Spread your scoop of peanut butter onto the face of one of your pieces of bread with the knife. Squeeze some jelly onto the other piece of bread. Spread the jelly on the bread with the butter knife. Put your two pieces of bread, peanut butter and jelly sides together. Done. Now eat it. Not the best. Well, you made it. But so I, I think it qualifies. That's a win. Woohoo! <laughs> well, Evan and Jonah, did that go as you expected? <laughs> yes. I expected to win. Well. You sort of won. But really, I feel like we were all losers. Did you guys have fun at all? Yeah. There were, there were at least a few points where it seemed like Evan was kind of having fun. He's like... So, <clears throat> what do we learn from this video? Do not write stories. <gasps> Thank you for coming for the workshop. I'll see you next time. <laughs> How to not write user stories, okay? <clears throat> they could have shown how to make, this is what you want. So a developer will know what to make if another developer makes it and gives it to them. Probably, okay. Ask the customer what they want, okay. Sorry? Details, you need to get into the details. Ask for feedback, okay. Hmm. So actually a few months back, this video started popping up everywhere on social media with the tagline that you can only you have to be extremely detailed with your requirements. Otherwise, you will not be able to build whatever you want. So your stories need to be precise in details. In short, the job description should say, you need to get a few people who have OCD. They need to write your requirements and give it to the developers. Otherwise, the developer is going to be like Josh and going to say, I'm just building whatever you told me to. That's crap. You're not supposed to dive into the details on paper. Now rethink this entire thing. All Josh wanted was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. If the two of them would have sat in front of him and told him step by step what they expect, they could have basically made it in, at least not in six minutes, it could have been in what, a minute, maybe. Made and given it to him. See, usually when we are working in teams, usually when we are working in teams, everyone has different roles. Okay? So, Our developers are useless. They are in the habit of taking things on the plate and then giving it back to the product owner. You don't write good stuff. I, I hate my developers. How to validate our stories are complete. So let's do that. Let's write a story together. The customer gets a peanut butter and jelly sandwich when they order it. 
here is the acceptance criteria. What's the difference between what you read versus what you saw? What you saw was someone explaining the steps of how you need to do something in the video. What you have here is the outcome that is expected. I don't care how you make it. That's what we call as tests. The first one says your sandwich is going to be 3 inches wide, 4 inches long. Objective tests. It cannot be anything beyond that. Nothing less, nothing more. Thickness is missing. Okay, we'll refine the story. We are always open for discussion. Sandwich has to be exactly two, uh, two pieces, slice one, slice two. Slice one has 100 grams of peanut butter. Slice two has 100 grams of jelly. The customer doesn't get peanut butter and jelly on their hands. That's a non-functional requirement. I'm not saying this is a perfect story. Probably if you give this to your developers, they might still be able to make you a sandwich if you want them to make you a sandwich. The thing to note is, the belief is that we need to be detailed. You don't need to be. In fact, have you ever complained that uh, whoever writes requirements in your teams, maybe your PO, maybe your BA, whoever, they are bad because they don't give everything in detail? You hear? You get lots of details. If they don't give you details, will you complain? But if they don't give you details, they are actually the best ones to keep. That's not open-ended. Fine, we'll talk through it. Yeah, availability is outside the scope of this workshop. <laughs> but yeah, I take your point. Uh, so you work towards reducing the details. Reducing the details. Okay, so the first thing, reduce the details. Have more conversations because you already said it's a conversation starter, right? It's a placeholder for conversation. Next one, <coughs> the creation steps are to be left to the people who are skilled to implement it. You can tell the chef what you want. You can't tell the chef how to make it. Right? Your requirements, your stories, whatever it is, it is telling you what you want with some objectivity behind it. That's when we call it as tests. You can't give the details, you can't give the steps. How many of you have seen stories where it says, uh, the screen loads, there are two text boxes on the screen. When the button is clicked, something happens. Have you seen that story? Cool. Bad stories to have. Too many implementation details. You will still need tests for that. We'll come to that later. Finally, the acceptance conditions must be provided and they are to be provided by the customer or the user of the system. If you are not getting the acceptance test and the acceptance conditions from the users, you will always face a challenge. So keep this in mind if you want to make peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <coughs> Moving on, let's spend a few minutes. Have you heard of invest? Maybe not five minutes, a little less, because we are running a bit late. Heard of invest? Yes. We are not going to do anything with invest in this workshop. Okay. But just, what have you known? What do you know about invest? It is independent piece of functionality. It's negotiable, which means you can slice and dice it as long as it's a vertical slice. It's valuable to a user. Uh, it is testable. It's estimatable. It's testable. So many of us miss out on the testable aspect of it. We focus more on the steps, we focus less on the testability of it. That's precisely where we want to move towards. Ultimately, your stories need to have tests. Because if you don't have tests, then you will not be able to fulfill what you want. 
Everyone okay with Invest? Anyone who's not heard of Invest? All of these uh, slides are available on Confingen. There's also a bunch of references in the description. You can go and check out the references. So let's move on to an exercise. And this is where we come to part three. Specification by examples. More precisely, specification as tests. When we work with requirements, especially when we are working with huge documents, there's a lot of emphasis on the steps. Moving away from it towards scenarios. There are scenarios that will occur when your customers are working with the system. What should happen in those scenarios? And every scenario has a test case that needs to pass in order to be accepted. That's your acceptance test. So specification by examples, it's a single source of truth. It doesn't matter what your role is. You can be a CEO, you can be the CTO, the BA, the developer, the tester, whoever. Everyone understands a test case. It's a scenario. It's a single source of truth for everything. You define the expectations objectively, which can be validated. Test cases are always objective, right? You have test data associated with it. So it's objective. If they pass, the story is successful. If they don't, the story is not. You assure the teams and the business stakeholders that the software that is built is being built for the right purpose. Because if your test cases fail, that means the software is not achieving what it's supposed to achieve. And the entire aspect, we also discussed rails earlier, right? Uh, rates and other things that you might add into a story. A story is not ready until the time you have the test identified. If you have the test identified, it is ready for development. You may not have all the tests identified if you have assumptions and other things, in which case you cannot develop that story. You can slice it so that you can develop a part of it if it still gives you a good value. Uh, gives the customer good value. But otherwise, if you have assumptions and you don't have all the tests in place, you can't. So your stories are not ready. So let's take this a step ahead. How do you identify the test cases? And that's where the three amigos come into picture. Right? These are the three aspects or the three viewpoints that you require for any requirement to be built. There is a business viewpoint, there is a development viewpoint, and there is a testing viewpoint. It doesn't matter who's playing this role. You need the three viewpoints. For the ease of it, we just assign roles to it, so you have individuals who are doing this. Regardless, as long as these three perspectives are being concerned, you're fine. So we'll do a small role play. On each table, you'll be in a trio. So just assign yourself a role. You can, it's fine. It's not going to change your job description. Assign any role to yourself. Okay. So someone has to be business. Someone has to be developer. Someone has to be tester. So I'm just going to call out and raise your hand who you want to be. It's not a, like a group table activity. You're going to be over here. But every table, group of three. Uh, anyone who wants to be business, each table at least one. Each table at least one, two is fine. Remember your roles, okay? Business, business, okay. Remember your roles, because you have to speak after this. Developers, every table at least one. Okay. Testing, every table at least one. Okay. Every person needs to have a role. So if you don't have a role, <coughs> then we'll have to get into some other kind of exercise afterwards. Fine? So we are doing a role play, you need to pay attention on the screen. Everyone here? Yes. Something's going to come up in the screen. I'm not going to say what. I'm not going to give any cues. You'll see your role. You'll see some things written over there. Don't worry, the text is perfectly fine that you can read out loud. You just have to read through, nothing else, but loudly. So everyone in that role will basically shout out loud whatever you see on the screen. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Louder and in sync. Okay. Once more. We have three types of parking lots. Some have cost per hour, some per day, some have daily or weekly maximum. <coughs> How do you refer to the different parking lots? Are there any common and two different You can come in front, sir. And names for them. Okay, next one. Valley, valley, valley parking, short term parking, and regular parking. So, these are the which we are what can you tell us about the parking cost? Valid parking cost dollars eighteen per day for five hours or less. Okay, testers who are missing out. Wait a moment. Wait a minute. For even 30 minutes, I get charged 12 dollars for 3 hours. I have to pay the same as well as for 5 hours. But okay, you have to be slightly louder at least. The room should be louder than me. But for 5 hours, I have to pay 18 dollars. Okay, so let me help you out. Maybe the font is small. <laughs> Yes, absolutely right. What about 24 hours? What about 24 hours? Would this be 30 dollars or 36 dollars? Uh, 36 What about weekly limits? Are there any for bank parking? No, that's basically all they are. That's basically all they are Chris for Ali Park. What about weekly limits? Are there any bank parking limits? Hey folks, the two last two slides are exactly the same here. As I half-heartedly don't read it, please pay attention to it. <laughs> okay, here's the, here's the point. No one wanted, I mean, you don't remember it, it's fine. There are conversations that happen. This is an example of a conversation. Whether you went through the entire thing or not. What is important is what you see on this screen. There are three folks who have discussed a few things about a parking valley problem. They have identified some examples. And now those examples are something that they are basically going to put out here. This is test data. You park for 30 minutes, you pay $12. You park for 3 hours, you pay $12. You park for 5 hours and 1 minute, you pay 18 And if you park for a week, you pay 126 There are no seconds in this. No seconds in this. Bad programmers. Okay. <laughs> Can this be a story? Or is this a story in your view? This is a story for me. It's too big. It's too big. Reduce it. It's fine. We started with templates. I'm saying this is the written form of your story. If you have this, you know what you need to achieve. At least those who are going to program know what they want to achieve. This is a story. You don't need a template. What you need are tests. There's also something known as behavior driven development. Heard of it? Yes. So a person named Dan North came up with it. And the philosophy behind behavior driven development is that you're capturing the behavior. And the behavior that ultimately gets captured is as a part of tests. Now, over time, there is something known as Gherkin scripts that we have started using. These are the keywords. 
Using these keywords, you can determine how you want to build your stories. But there's a catch. Just by using the keywords, you will not write good stories. You still need to know how to write good stories. Or writing is still the last part, how to utilize stories. So to give you an example, you can still write, given the page is loaded on the screen, when I click on a button, then the movie starts. It's not a good story because it has steps. Can you convert that into tests is the question. Right? When someone wants to play a movie, there are many things that can happen. Maybe your server is not reachable. What happens then? Maybe your bandwidth is low. What happens then? Will the resolution change automatically? What happens if you go offline? Those are the tests that you need to catch. So, you had written a story in the beginning, right? <coughs> Take a look at that story. After two slides, we are going to come to it. But before that, how many of you write stories for user authentication? Username passwords. To view your emails, you need to log in first, right? You're right? Probably user authentication is the worst story that you can have, but we are still going to use it for the purpose of the workshop. The reason why I say they are worst stories to be discussed or had is because you all have cell phones, you got your email applications on it. Will it be a good experience for you if every time you click on your Gmail application or whatever you have, that it prompts for your password? No, that's why I that's why SSO is there. So if you write a story that talks about the username is captured, the password is captured, username password does not match, what's my error message, or something is blank, something is not blank, yes, they are test cases that you have to consider. But there are different ways of utilizing those stories. An authentication screen in itself is of no use. It needs to take you somewhere. So what I have over here is an example of where authentication can be used. Since you mentioned SSO, SSO is there. This is a user story for authentication. Not the entire authentication, but a part of it. But this is how a user story will look if I am utilizing DDD or Gherkin to write it. Now even before I reach to this point to write, we did the three amigos. The three amigos is the exercise for identifying these test cases. Everything that you see in double quotes is basically test data. And everything that you see under examples is test data as well. These are just two different ways of writing it. Scenario outline is like a template. So we discussed template earlier. So you can put your templates and you can give the test data, which is a bunch of test data like the valet example. Or you can write something in double quotes and that will still be valid as a test case. This is a user story. I'm not forcing you to use user stories in this format when you go back, as long as you have the tests identified. That's specification using tests or examples. Now earlier when we started, we said that you can tear off and throw it away. Then where will you find the requirements in the future if you want to go? If someone had that, you had the question. Your tests are your specifications. You don't need to show the specification to someone who's a CEO, right? A developer needs to know what's ha what has been made, or what was done, or what was discussed. Your code and your test are specifications. Clean code and tests, that's what you need. That's the reason why we said that, hey, you can tear it off and throw it off. Because you have taken care of it once you have code. Now the story that you wrote earlier, this is my version for it. Similar? No? What's the difference? As in difference between what you wrote and what you see here? It's still there, so it's, uh, it's not a complete story. 
Yeah. Very specific. Isn't that good? You got to add uh, again that point that it is too detailed. How the details? We started that we should not put so much of detail. It's, it's more. Uh, I think this not, is. Uh, we are more technical, not mm -hmm. having the layman language which anybody can understand. Mm -hmm. This is uh, anyone doesn't need to understand. The three amigos need to understand. I think everybody should be able to understand that. Why? Story. I mean, um, in a group, you only don't have uh, people with technical background. Right? Sometimes you have VA, sometimes. You know, some people who don't get into too much details and technicalities, and that is the reason I feel sometimes working language, I mean, working with syntax and all, we don't use. <laughs> so let me counter that by saying that it doesn't matter whether you use, you use Gherkin or not. Mm -hmm. If this is something that your team is not able to identify, your teams are always going to fight on what was asked. No, we can have it as a part of the acceptance criteria or I mean, test design or. But when we are putting it as a conversation starter, I would not... This is not a conversation starter. This is the end product of the conversation. This is the end product of your conversation. Most likely the conversation starter is just this. But what I have seen small question I always develop for us. This is in web or it is in app data. So I can view in different ways. Your stories need to be reusable because the outcome is not changed. Outcome you can authenticate yourself through text, through biometric, through voice, through an access card, your ultimate thing is still going to be the same. As long as your ultimate tests are the same, it doesn't matter. You know, I have seen some people using Gherkin for writing messages. And that is where I think it's really good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. We write it with even then then, but not <coughs> as this, you know. Yeah, not uh, and and all that. We do this kind of uh, interesting, but specifically as we said, it will be an acceptance criteria. This is the other Yeah, that's the, uh, so in Jira, right? You have description in one place and then okay. acceptance criteria in another place. So, okay, these, these are acceptance tests. Yeah. Not correct. These are tests. How many times has the developer come back and said, this is what was written? Yeah. Here's an example of getting rid of those discussions. If you have tests which are objective, those are the problems that go away. But there's a much bigger problem that goes away, which we'll cover in the next section. I think it will not only useful for the testing team and the developers, but even for the product owners or rather the business when they realize, okay, yes, this is done. This is complete. We can now so move on to the next. I'm basically saying that this is a language for you to develop a software. If you don't wish to go to there, it's fine. But this kind of answers all the problems that we have. Yes. Yeah. This it's just a quick example. I mean, what I wanted to understand like this is a one big story, okay? Where we keep every organization keep pushing to go to a smaller level, small story, small story around it. If I give this to one developer to work on it, I'm just giving an example. Uh, yeah. He will take a month or so to complete this. I'm just giving. I mean, to understand it. Split so it. how when when we split this, what challenges comes around? So then my test cases have been uh, splitted around it. So then who will test together? You can the repeated work will be there. See, Although, every team is going to have a different definition of what is big and what is small. Your team can say that, hey, I have a weekly sprint, so this is too big. Another team might say, I have two weeks sprint, this is okay. Right? So, big and small is relative. You find it big, go ahead and split it. There will be a limit to what you can split. Then the time it becomes valuable. You wish to split it, split it. That's, That's what fine. Is now show me your email as my conversation starter. Hmm. Okay. So I use the conversation, I can arrive here. Hmm. So when it's splitting, we all talk about vertical slices. Yeah. How can I get to, can you give an example to slices in the vertical? Parking lot afterwards? Sure. Okay. We'll split this too. Alright? See, I'm not here to convince you that, hey, go back to your organization and start doing that. I'm just giving you an example of how your problems go away. That's the entire intent. <coughs> so let's do some housekeeping discussions. Yeah, we are here. You had a story written. I had a different variation to it. Both of those stories will have some aspects to it. There's still some things which we want to consider as good stories. Let's go through that list. Start with a goal. Goals are good to have. Ensure that 
invest vertical slice we already discussed that many of you mentioned it right close to it how do you write close to it tests so tests basically make it close to it now this is from a book by mike cohen that was written way way back i'm not even saying this at that point of time mike cohen said that you need accepting tests You need to put constraints. So in the earlier story, you may have seen I said that the page loads in 100 milliseconds. That 100 milliseconds is basically a test case, which is automated. So if it fails, you would come to know. Keep the UI out as long as possible. Your stories need to be in a way where the person or the people who are going to implement it, they get to decide what is the best way to achieve it. Maybe UI, because that's usually the way we, how we develop applications. It's not necessary that that's the only way to go through. So keep the UI out as long as possible. It won't be forever, as long as possible. Why are you trying to keep UI out? If you're going to have stories that talk about how your screen is going to look, the stories become too descriptive from a viewing perspective. There are better ways to show that. You can create screen designs and mockups and make it available to your teams. That will still convey the same message, but in a much better way. But what you will cover on the story end or on the testing end are the test cases that apply on that UI. So it will reduce your vertical slices too? Yes. You are trying to keep Having the UI in the story does not make, no, I'm not keeping it separate. These are still supplements. These are supplements. Why do you think it's a supplement? It is a supplement. We, we need another story then to integrate. No, we don't need another story to integrate it. So you usually the, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, old saying is, or the legacy, how we say is that since we do the hamburger technique, so the UI has to be included. Even if you do the workflow, workflow technique. So very simply put. Okay. Very simply, you're not going to write another story for UI. That's not the intent. Once you have your test cases, you may have someone who's creating the UI or discussing the UI. You're just going to get the UI designs from them. That's all. It's not going to change your story. The story is still going to be the same. Which is a part of business. The three amigos discussion. You will have it as supplements. It will not be written as a story, it will be supplements. You don't need to write that you need to click on a certain button. It will be as a part of your supplements, it will be there. You're not going to write another story for you. That's not going to happen. Uh, you need to have the user roles instead of users. There are loads of supplements that come, there are UI guidelines that you have to add. There are some compliance docs, and these are always available. These usually apply to the complete system. So regardless of what you're developing, that's like the underlying root that's always going to be there. That does not change. One card is written for one user and in active voice. You don't have more than one user being covered or one functionality being covered. And it's still a promise of a conversation. As long as you keep these things in mind, it's perfectly fine. So we have a definition of done. What is that? Let's first bring something out of the table. A definition of done is for the entire system, not for a story. But you still need to know when the story is done. If all of your acceptance tests are passing with automated tests, your story is done. So quickly to go through, it's a set of automated tests which are passing. May or may not be applicable to individual stories because definition of done is more at a system level. And finally, it must be executed after every commit. That's a part of CI. You'll come to know if something is failing or not. It will be immediate. At the same time, we also discuss definition of ready. We already said, your three amigos, identify the test together. 
if all the tests are identified that fulfill the purpose of the story, you are ready for development, which means that if you have assumptions, you are not ready for development. This is not a sign of process. This is something that your team is deciding and your teams will have much more test cases than let's say a CEO of the organization, so it's not a sign off. And definition of ready is also in some sense an anti-pattern. The reason why it's an anti-pattern is because you will identify more tests when you start developing. If you identify more tests, you're going to go and add during development. So your story is never really ready for development. There is an ongoing aspect to it. If you believe at a certain point of time that you have everything that you need in order to build a story, you can go ahead and start building the story. Right? But the biggest thing that I get from this entire process is a zero defect policy. You can actually have zero defects in your system if you take this approach. Do you believe in that state? No. No? I'm hurt, but okay. So let's take an example. Sorry? I haven't seen it ever, so. But you haven't done this kind of story as well. So. so, okay. So let's say what happens. In a typical context, a bug comes in production, it comes to the development team. The development team does a triage. Right? What's the purpose of that triage? First, identify if it's a bug or a change request because scope creep happens. Uh, then see if you fix now or fix later. Okay, so even if a bug comes like during the end of the iteration, and let's say there are two bugs, you might say one is minor, one is major. Minor, you push it, major, you fix it, something like that. And these are usually the things that we do during triage. Okay. The problem is, we can sit in a room and identify if the bug is minor, major, for a user. It's a change request, whatever it is. For the user, it's something that's not working. Does the user really care about your definitions? They don't. If the user comes and complains, hey, this is a bug, this needs to be fixed, and you say, yes, it is low in our priority because it's minor bug, maybe that person does not agree to it. Sure, that's the reason why we have product owners and they prioritize everything. But the point is that you're not supposed to have bugs in the first place. And the ethical software development teams that we are, we actually take money for solving bugs. That usually does not happen in other industries, right? So if you buy a car and the car is defective, at least in the warranty period, you get it replaced for free. But if there's a bug in production, and you're fixing the bug on a weekday between 9 and 5, you actually get paid for it. Ethical business, right? It's a joke. Don't worry so much. Don't take it hard. But that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to get into a zero defect policy. The idea of a zero defect policy is that everything as a requirement is a test, and the tests are passing. So if your tests are passing, then the functionality is complete. If ever in production a bug is reported, that's simply a missing test. At any given point of time, it's always a missing test. It doesn't matter what you call it. You call it a missing requirement, you call it a change request, you call it a bug. It's nothing but a missing test. When you think from that ideology, that's when we come to something known as a zero bug promise. Which means that when you are building stories in iterations or in sprints, and if one of the test cases fails, that story does not go into production. <coughs> you don't need to discuss if it's a major bug or a minor bug, it's a bug. It does not go into production till the time that bug is resolved, or in better ways to say it, that test case is addressed. And when we do that, and we fix the missing test, that's the only way to call it out, that we are a bug-free system. Now, this is again not a philosophy that I am stating. This was stated many, many years back. If 
you go on Confingen, the details of the page, you will find this talk. The talk is currently there on Agile Alliance. This is a way of working. When you work with tests as your specifications, then the tests ensure that you do not have bugs. The biggest takeaway of everything that you can do if you move towards acceptance test driven development. Happy? Yeah. As I said, the QR code may not scan because projector, but you can connect with me on LinkedIn. And we still, we do have six minutes. So any pending questions, I don't see anything on the parking lot, but any pending questions, even challenges, perfectly fine. Shoot. Keeping UI out, anything around that? Why shouldn't we have UI in the story? And we are saying that keep it as long as possible, not out. Yes. When you say keeping UI out, uh, you refer that you want to have a template, some build a UI around it. Use that for reference to create a story, right? I didn't get that point. Anyway. No, you said that, that build a template. UA template, something, how, how the base looks like or something like that. Use that to... That's something that your designing team okay. can take care of. Yeah, that's what. Yeah. You, based on that, we are expected to create a story, right? I'm, I'm just asking. You. Your stories are your tests. So there will be some tests that you need to fulfill. Okay? So let's say that the test that you want to fulfill, just as an example, is user registration. Now, when you want to perform user registration, you need to take care of your mandatory data. And you need to ensure that any, any test data that is going to fail or pass, you are taking care of. Fine? Once you have taken care of that, you can decide how that UI should be represented. I think you mentioned, it can be a website, it can be a mobile, a mobile app, it can be anything. Your test case is not going to change. So first decide on the functionality. Once you have decided on the functionality, then decide what is the best way to do it. When you decide on the best way to do it, the answer might be a UI. But what kind of UI? So that question of what kind of UI comes much later in the conversation. And that's the idea of keeping the UI out for as long as possible. First start deciding what is it that you want to achieve. And slowly and steadily you will move to that. You're not saying keep it out forever. But defer it as much as, don't start with that. Don't start by saying I need a website. Start by saying what do I want to achieve. And then later on come to that. Okay, so the same, same question around this UI part, the slicing part comes back mm -hmm. for me. I have a UI, I, I'm building a story around the test cases around that UI. Mm. I want to slice it into smaller. So I have UI developed by my UI team, currently my team works on the only <coughs> functionality around the test around it. Now, every every developer, every people are asking, ask, I mean, asking me is how to slice it. So I, I can I slice it, create a mock UI, then add a UI API around it in the back end, so it's a separate uh, story kind of. There will be some context I'll have to understand from you. From this Very simple, thing. I wanted to understand how, in your example, how can I slice a user story? Your story, when we talk about vertical slicing and it's easier said than done at times, is because when we look at textbooks and we talk about vertical slicing, we usually explain through the terms of UI. So when we create that vertical slice cake picture that you see, it shows a vertical slice means the UI is covered, the middle layer is covered and the database layer is covered, right? That's what we have learned. Theoretically, that is correct. Take that in a different aspect. If you would be writing software for Alexa, there is no UI. Will your story be vertical sliced? So the idea of a vertical slice is that it needs to go through an entire piece of functionality in all the levels. So if you have different teams that are doing different job, and you take a part of the story and give it to them, that would be wrong. Because the story stays in the same place with all the test cases and the teams need to come together and figure out how to build it. Yeah. So think of vertical slice as ensuring that every aspect of that functionality is covered, it's not missed out. That's all. Okay? 
So that's the idea of uh, vertical slice. I know textbooks always tell us UI, middle layer, and database. So that's why how we have learned it. A vertical slice simply is your functionality has to be going across the system. No, oh, that I, I mean, that I understand. My point is, in your example, I see that is a bigger story. Yeah, which how example? The, the email one. Email one. How does you slice that? That's the only thing I wanted to understand. For your, let's say you. That's would, for me. That is a perfectly fine story to implement. That's why I'm saying that the context will differ how you slice. For me, that story is perfectly fine. Okay, you are saying that one developer can do that complete story in a sprint. That the development team can, can do it. I don't care if it's one developer or many. I think that's probably the missing piece there because looking at it as one person working on it, See, there's, 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 a a much, there's a much bigger aspect of software development that we need to talk about from process standpoint. This is just a tool. Basically, a tool or a method that we are going to use. And context will matter. Every organization team will have a different context. It will matter. If I may add on to this, so practically, me and my team are given this user story, and if it does take, let's say, just one developer not being able to do it in one sprint, it's okay. What am I intended to do? I'm intended to deliver business value, and I'm delivering business value, even if it is taking me longer cycle time and then a sprint. Nothing is breaking. Go for it. What gives you comfort of developing it to the business need? That's more important. So I, I think from a definition standpoint where that might become concerning is when we talk about invest yeah. and the S is for small, yeah. the definition of small is it can be done in an iteration. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, if it cannot be done in an iteration, you will have to split the story. At the same time, there is a limit to the split. If you can achieve it, good for you. If you can't, it's fine. There are times when you will have to say this story cannot be split further. It's not going to be done in an iteration and that's okay. There is no agile police who's going to come and question. Ultimately, you're going to deliver something. But yes, from a definition standpoint, you want small stories. So there has to be some effort to ensure you're creating stories that are done in, a, in one iteration, one sprint. Just the story which you have I am saying for my team it is fine, it is context, for one team it may be okay, for another team it may not be. Okay, I see a few parallel discussions happening, but are we good? Yes. You have question? Okay. The, I'll answer your question, but the tea time has started. So those who want to have tea or coffee, or if I have actually shaken your... Um, persona quite a lot then stay back and I'm happy to talk but if you want to have your beverages they are served outside for any questions I'm happy to answer thank you once again for attending the workshop and do stay connected I really like it